Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Um, Okay, yes, now we move uh, further on in time into the modern time and into an ethnoarchaeological study, people adaptation and material culture, an ethnoarchaeological study of immigration from Siberia. And uh, maybe let's start at, uh, I mean, we've heard a whole day already about migration and what it is and why we have to study it. And let me maybe take the starting point in this concept of archaeological culture, which is in a way outdated, and which ha has made uh, it's way from, from these sort of monolithic cultures, patterns in material culture, to a more fluid and much more um, diversified picture. For example, this concept of communities of practice, which uh, are much better fitting to all these dynamics uh, which are reflected in material culture. But this said, as we all know, there are, of course, developments connected, for example, to the third science uh, revolution and especially the ADNA analysis which have seen a bit of a renaissance of the seemingly older concepts of those um, monolithic uh, understandings of um, archaeological cultures as connected, for example, to even like ethnic groups and language uh, carriers, um, uh, even uh, sort of published in this paper uh, called Costner's Smile by Volker Haidt, this problem, which in a way takes this premise again that an archaeological culture equals a language group and equals a kinship group. Um, so um, I think that ethnoarchaeological approaches um, can help us to understand the, um, the way such patterns in material culture uh, emerge and in what way they are connected or not connected to things like migration and also other things like uh, self-identification and ethnic self-conceptions. So ethnoarchaeology is uh, situated between archaeology and cultural anthropology and is in, in this way a very good um, approach to uh, answer questions which archaeology itself is not uh, sufficient uh, to, to do so, also through self-reflection um, and analogies, of course. So concerning um, migration, uh, it can add to what we can uh, investigate through archaeology, genetics, and also isotopic studies, for example, about the movements of people and their uh, material culture. Um, I will not go into the details here, but uh, it can really add to several of those points which we can study, uh, level of immigration, subject, migration itself, and the interpretation through different sets of um, information. In order to better understand through a bottom-up approach, uh, the more general structural questions, for example, how environments, mobilities, and technologies and identities can be entangled, um, how changing conditions, uh, 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 how, how, how can changing con conditions, for example, affect these aspects through migration, um, and we can um, partly identify structural patterns as well as the role of random triggers and effects. Um, and what is also very important, we can test archaeological visibility because in these recent migration uh, migrations, which we can study in ethnoarchaeology, we can see what we actually can see uh, with archaeological means or not. So let me take it to an area which is, um, well, uh, quite empty when we look from an anglophone perspective. This is a, a map of the societies in the human relation area files, and you see. Uh, Siberia, northern Eurasia is quite empty, but our study is actually located there. And I will show you briefly the community of the northern Selkup in western Siberia and uh, what we can learn about a certain migration which took place in this area. So um, on the map you see uh, th this orange thing shows uh, the southern uh, Selkup area and then this northern area where they migrated in the um, 17th and 18th century, part of the community. Um, so it, it is an indigenous community in Western Siberia, which has the Samoyedic language. And we know from the ethno-historical sources, from the Russian sources, that this um, migration took place. And also that the incoming northern Selkup in this new homeland, in this different environment in the northern taiga, um, actually evicted a local group, another Samoyedic language group, the Ensi. 
And in the north, the Sakup community continued life ways as nomadic hunter-fishers, but uh, there was one important economic change. They adopted reindeer herding in the north, whereas in the south there were hunters and fishers. So um, a Russian-German uh, team has, been, uh, has, has done research in this region exactly uh, in order to study this sub-recent migration and to find out what we can actually trace archaeologically. And uh, the Sarkoop uh, region is a very remote area, which takes several days to get there by helicopter, boat, and several planes and trains. Um, and what we also do is investigate actually the taphonomy and archaeological visibility of this immigration uh, area. Um, this work uh, is a cooperation, as I said, um, with uh, my colleagues Alexander Kenig, uh, Andrei Novikov, um, and uh, our team did the last expeditions in 2020 and uh, 2021, and now, of course, it's not possible to work there anymore together, at least not in the field. So let me quickly tray or uh, sketch this uh, life way of this northern Sakuk community as it is today. So the settlement system is up until today a seasonal settlement of a mobile group with seasonal, seasonal stations, which involve actually uh, tippy like tents for uh, temporal hunting and fishing sites, but also winter earth houses, um, which are also a very traditional type of dwelling, which goes back actually as a type many millennia. Um, the life is and the economy are based on hunting, fishing and collecting. Of course, also they also buy flour and tea in shops um, in the cities. And as I said, they have adopted uh, small scale reindeer herding in the north. What is also interesting in our uh, question about uh, the situation in the wake of this immigration is that the Sarkoop community is uh, situated within a network of different uh, other indigenous groups with other identities and other languages. Um, for example, the Evangs, the Kids, Russians are there, of course, as well, and the Khanti. And uh, the Sarkoop community is, uh, uh, is connected through exogamic uh, relations to these different um, groups, whereas um, the ad other groups, such as the Nenet, who also have a Samoyedic uh, language, are seen as enemies and they don't intermarry with them. Um, one example, which is mentioned by Kai Donna, but stuff, uh, some, uh, situations like this continue and up until today, is uh, in the 20s actually, uh, is that a man whose mother was an Evenki woman and whose father was a Hunt, had a wife who was a Kate, Kate and who he himself spoke, you uh, know, the Kate wife also spoke Sarkoop, and the person as well spoke Sarkoop, but also all the other languages. So we have a very international, or as Kai Donna said, uh, terribly international, almost cosmopolitan conditions already uh, 20, uh, two, uh, 100 years ago, but this continues up until today. Of course, our work there with the Sarkoop community uh, is, uh, gives us a really rich uh, input on indigenous knowledge and local indigenous perspective uh, from which we can learn really a lot about understanding these hunter-gatherer life ways, socio-economic adaptations and of course multi-species uh, um, uh, societies, only this is uh, the topic of a different session here. So in the last part of my talk I would like to talk a little bit about these immigration trajectories and what we can see about the cultural change and these intercultural relations which have developed in this immigration area. So let's take a look at the changes in economy in the north, in this immigration area. The adoption of reindeer herding into this hunting and fishing um, life way, which they took up from the south, um, is actually quite impactful in all sorts of different parts of these life ways. Um, the reindeer is only used for winter transport of the sledges. So it's not really, they are not herds for meat or so, but it's really a transport thing which is necessary for winter hunting. And the Sarkoop have developed a very interesting niche construction adaptation uh, uh, of this reindeer herding by keeping the reindeer voluntarily by the settlements through the provision of smoke houses which take away the mosquitoes. So it's nice for the reindeer to come to the settlements themselves. And in winter they are fed with fish in addition, and that also keeps them close to the human settlement, so it's like a, a really mutual relationship. 
Um, but uh, it's also a change is the adaptations in the settlement system because only in the north the Selkuk took up the conical tent from surrounding groups like the Cates, for example, and integrated it into their seasonal settlement system. While in the south they had a more um, fixed seasonal round without the reindeer from fishing sites to hunting sites to fishing sites and they lived in these earth houses because they knew exactly where they would be every year. And only through the reindeer herding it became necessary to have these lighter constructions because the reindeer pastures shift every year and they're quickly exploited and so that's why they have to go to different places every almost every year and hence adopted this lighter style of dwelling. But at the same time they also um, preserved the older type of dwelling, the earth house. So we see historical examples here, we even in our research we excavated sub-recent examples in the presence of the former dwellers who gave us of course a lot of inter interesting information, how many people lived there, why they lived there, what they did in, the, in these winters and so on. Um, so the, they also kept up their traditional house, although it's not necessary because the surrounding groups uh, like, the, uh, like the Enids actually have the similar reindeer lifeway only with the conical tent without um, these uh, earth houses. So that's something that took north. So if we summarize this, uh, these adaptations in the settlement system, we have the old southern form, which is definitely coming from the south because we have also ethnographic uh, evidence for them in the Hanti region further south. Then there was an uh, impact uh, which uh, triggered changes, the reindeer husbandry, and also this new form which they adopted from the surrounding groups, the tent. And this changed the type of uh, earth dwelling because it lost its sunken floor, because it's quicker to build without the sunken floor, but it kept the earth and wall. And the interior structure went from this asymmetrical structure with a clay oven to a more tent-like symmetrical structure. So we have a hybrid form of this old earthen house con together with the new input of the conical tent. And other adaptations concern, for example, burial rituals, so the south, southern Sekup had these kurgans, these gra grave mounds, and in the north they took up a Hanti, a Hanti tradition, this is a group which they went through on their way to the north, which have like influenced uh, Russian type burials, normal earth graves with, uh, with bodies. Um, but we also see even syncretic burial sites. For example, here is the Selkup burial site from the 2000s, and it involved one Nenitz type air burial. There was a specific uh, horrible story about death in the family, and the shaman told them, You have to bury the last son who died as a Nenitz, and that's what they did. So. As archaeologists, we would never disentangle that situation behind that. Um, and also in material culture, um, there were massive adaptations in the north. They took a lot of technology from the surrounding groups, for example, these Nenit sledges. Um, and there's almost no specific cell coupe style in the material culture. We have found one uh, birch bark vessel, which actually mirrors the very specific southern cell coupe, um, birch bark um, decoration, but that's really singular. And the last thing I want to mention is the actual self-identity and language dynamics uh, of the our Selkup partners. One example would be Sergei Bayakin, who's, for example, a master in making logboats. Um, his father was an Evenk, completely different fa language family, so it's Tungus language and not a Samoyedic language. It, his first language was Evenki. Then he moved to Archangelsk, only spoke Russian there as a young man. Before he returned to the Tiger, to his parents, and there he only became a Serkup and learned to deal with the reindeer. And now he's one of the heads of the Serkup community and speaks Serkup. His wife, Inga Irikova, is from another tributary, and her mother was a Kate, also with a different language, which is an isolated language group. And the third example would be Yulia Morokova, who sees herself as a Serkup. Um, her mother is a kid from the Yenisei. Her father was an Evenk from the Tass River, and uh, he, who died shortly after her birth. And when she was four years, four, years, four years old, her mother married a Selkup of this Morokov family, and Julia became Selkup. So you can imagine the situation, how it would look in genetic studies. So to summarize, um, what we see in the Selkup community 
and we bear in mind this uh, communities of practice uh, idea, there is an underlying big Russian global culture, like with the shops and, and the oil industry and everything, which of course influences very much the life is today. Then we have a Sarkup and Khanti uh, thing, which is this, this earthen house, which are also the birch bark ornaments, certain burial types. We have a more arctic sort of phenomenon, which concerns the, con, uh, concerns the reindeer husbandry and also the sledge style, this, this name is sledge style. Um, we have the chum, as in the, the tippy type tent, which probably was adopted from the cage or other groups around. And from the Evenki, we even have reindeer riding, which I didn't mention now, but there is actually ethno-historical evidence that the Sarkup sometimes actually, actually rode the reindeer as the Evenki do, and lighter tent types, which I also didn't show. Then we have the language, the Sarkup language, which is, which is used up until today in the north, which connects this community to the, their southern homelands, if you want to call them like this. And what we have in, in reality is this northern Sarkup identity, which is at the intersection of all these spheres, and the question would be, what do we see of this situation archaeologically? Um, well, territorial, uh, the Northern Sekup community is territorially distinct and has a strongly developed ethnic self-identification. But this is processual, socially determined, and not necessarily through Sekup ancestry at all. It is, though, expressed by the conscious maintenance of the language, and our partners say they consciously pass it on to their children as their own language, as Swayazik. Um, the material culture in the North has evolved further in this new homeland. It contains practical adaptations to the new environment and also the new economic uh, conditions by adopting suitable styles and types from these, all these other Northern groups. And there is actually hardly any identity marker in the material culture which we could actually see archaeologically. The thing is that the main marker, the language, is archaeologically invisible. And it is the main field of the TAS, Sarkup identity enactment. And this com complex and dynamic interplay of individual identity, language, kinship relations, and material cultures, culture, well, is really a, a problem archaeologically, if we would like to see it like this. And so the existence of this community, I would say, would likely be diluted in a material continuum of, re of regional styles, hybrid items, and adaptive solutions. So in this case, we can really strongly show that archaeological culture is not congruent to speaker community and not to kinship groups. And so I would like to thank uh, to, um, to, the part to the SACU partners, to my Russian colleagues, to my uh, German PhD students or Canadian and German PhD students, Morgan and Tanya, and also to the financing bodies, the Gerda Henkel Stiftung and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Um, and I wanted to make two announcements. One is the Kiel conference in uh, 2023. You're all invited. There's a lot of really interesting sessions coming up. And uh, also, we relaunched the, the Ethnographic Archaeological Zeitschrift in Kiel, which has a long-standing tradition. But of course, uh, we want to make it a real accessible and um, yeah, post-humanist endeavor, uh, diamond open access, any language possible. Um, it's peer-reviewed as well as open sections in it, and the first volume will publish the proceedings of our Boas Talks conference in Kiel. Thank you. <laughs>